also would like to avail this opportunity to thank Dr. Santosh Ayappan for from IASR for giving me this opportunity. So, <laughs> as you all know that I have never worked on any spice, but I really enjoy spices, and I am big foodie. So you can imagine that how much how much love I do to spices. So, but in this presentation, I will be talking about some non-model crops and the idea of this talk is as discussed earlier that when some of these legume crops about which i'm going to talk that if genomics can improve the crop productivity crop pro and then enhance the crop productivity by addressing the issue of abiotic and biotic stresses i think that this can happen in any crop including a spices crop so with this perspective i would like to start and uh, yeah so as we all know that, and many of us also are aware about this title, The Spice of Life, we have seen sometimes some movies as well, some books like that thing. But today let's talk about the life of spices. And basically that well, we all know, and I do not need to give a preaching here that well, you are having the DNA, et cetera. But the point is how we can change the shape of the lives of those spices in terms of making them more High, more yielding, also more healthy in the different aspects. So with this objective, and as the title of my presentation is related to genomics, so I will talk a little bit about the genomics interventions. Again, to the young colleagues who are new to this business, all of you may be aware or are aware that basically we are having, in addition to many, but I will say that two main necessity, one is the human health, another is agriculture. Agriculture provides you the food and uh, health really keeps you healthy and then make you really fit to work. Sometimes when you are not having the problem of the food, then we are always worried about health. And as we know that life expectancy has increased, etc. And during last 100 years, and we would like to continue to ex extend it further with this objective in 1990s. There was a start of this human genome sequencing project. Idea was that can we decode all the genes related to the different diseases. And not only that, based on these things, can we develop the genomic medicines? That was the idea. And then this took 13 years to complete the human genome project, which took about $3 billion as well. But the good news is that now we have reached to a stage where and during this course, we had a lot of advances in the genomics technology, sequencing technology, in number of that crops, animal, plant, all these different kinds of species were sequenced. And thanks to those advances in the technology, and just yesterday, this Nature Review Genetics, Nature, Nature Biotechnology, etc., they have published a milestone in genome sequencing, where I was also part of one of these milestone advisors for this group. And what they have talked here that, well, the first development of the, the first time the sequencing happened in 1970s. So basically we have completed about 50 years. And then, and uh, so, but then in real life, this came just 40 years back. So basically we are having the 40th anniversary of Sanger sequencing. So idea is that how these sequencing have shaped and contributed to the health and plants, uh, health and agriculture, etc. Those of you who are interested, they can read. This was just released today itself. Now, with this excitement that, well, genome sequencing can contribute a lot. What we have done at Ecreset, and Ecreset, many of you who may be aware, we are the CGR Research Institute. We are based in Hyderabad, but our research operations are in several countries in Africa and Asia. And we work on chickpea, pigeon pea, palmillet, groundnut, and sorghum, so four or five important crops, which are really important crops for the poor farmers, the smallholder farmers, in rainfield environments. But in these environments, the crops are exposed to a number of biotech and abiotic stresses. Breeders have been doing a great job. They have developed several improved varieties. However, the pace of the development of those varieties is not as per expectation. So we need to use, we need to embrace the new technology. And with this perspective, many of you are already aware that you have heard about this genomics assisted breeding, molecular breeding, etc. So now, to utilize those approaches, you need to have the genomic tools. And when we started way back in 2007, our genomic center started in 2007, we did not have those resources. 
But now, together with the partners from India and abroad, we have developed the genome assemblage of pigeon pea, chickpea, palm millet, groundnut, etc. And not only that one, several other crops as well, sesame, moong bean, aju ki bean, jatrop, etc. So the purpose of this slide is, now, you can assemble the genome for any spices crop in which you are having interest. And nowadays, this is very easy. And these were the those days were gone that the genome sequencing projects used to be led by the developed countries. But now we can do these things while set in India and we can assemble the genome in of any crops of to really of high standard. Sometimes even when you know, and when I was talking about palm millet, people do not know much about palm millet. They call it, oh, this is non-model crop, orphan crop. Some people, they ask that, well, I love wheat, I love maize, rice, so wheat and rice, they're very important crop. But now, how the genome information from that non-model crop or that crop like palm millet can be useful in that leading crop. And here we have shown that after the this sequencing of palm millet genome, we have done the analysis about the drought tolerance and heat tolerance related genes in palm millet because palm millet is the crop which can survive even at the 42 degrees Celsius temperature. Maize, wheat and rice, they cannot have really good flowering at the more than 35 degrees Celsius temperature. In the context of the climate change, when you will be having higher temperature, then the question is, can you force all the community or human population to feed palm millet? Probably not, because we all have the habit to eat rice, right? But now we need to produce the rice, which can survive at the 42 degrees Celsius temperature. So with this objective, in this palm millet genome, we have identified several interesting genes, mainly related to the VEXI biosynthesis pathways. And this information is very helpful to use the information coming from the non-model crops to that and going to the really leading crops like wheat and rice. Same thing, this crop called pigeon pea, many of us, at least in India, we know about pigeon pea because pigeon pea used to prepare dal and also sambar, etc. But now abroad in, inter, in developed countries, or they don't know much about pigeon pea, but they know soya bean. But in the soya bean, rust is a problem. There is no natural variation for soya bean rust, but when we develop this pigeon pea genome, some of our collaborators, they were very successful to use one of the pigeon pea gene to improve the resistance for the Asian soybean rust in soybean. So you can see that how the information from an orphan crop, non-model crops can be translated in a leading crop. So these are some of these examples. Anyway, so we can develop the genome sequences, assemblies with the help of bioinformatics approaches, you can predict the gene. But sometimes we do not understand that which stage, what time point these genes are expressed. So to address this issue, we have developed the gene expression atlas. Atlas like when children are studying in that grade five or so that you are having the atlas that which place is located, which state or country or continent the same way. Now with this help of the gene expression atlas, we have figured out which gene will be expressed at what level, at which tissue, which time, etc. And these are very helpful when you would like to understand the molecular mechanism for some complex trait like drought tolerance. Same thing we have done in the case of pigeon pea where we have developed the gene expression atlas in pigeon pea. Now we are using this thing for understanding the, understanding the hybrid mechanism in the case of pigeon pea. Anyway, although we are working on several crops, but because of the shortage of time, we'll not talk much. But what I want to tell that when you would like to do the breeding, and I know that all of us are very much interested to develop the better varieties for any crop, including spices. So what you need to have, you need to have the cost-effective genotyping platform. You don't want to genotype any population, segregating population at large expenses, because then breeding program will say, hey, I don't have that much money. So what we have been doing at Ikri said we have developed these different kind of genotyping platform because one size does not fit all. So in the case, if you need to do genome-wide association studies, then you need to use arrays like SNP arrays or whole genome resequencing. Sometimes if you need to do the trait mapping, you can do the GBS or SSR markers. And nowadays, we are also using a new molecular breeding approach called genomic prediction where we are having these mid-density arrays. So the cost is very relatively low to these different kind of platforms. So this is one of the things that once you have these genomic resources, you need to have the genomics platform. Now, the other thing is that you need to understand the genetic variation because if you are working for some trade like drought, then you need to understand that well, which gene are responsible for drought. With this objective, we also have sequenced large scale germ plant collection. Like in the case of pigeon pea, we sequenced this genome, you know, two, more than uh, 292 lines. 
and based on this information we got large scale markers also you can use this information to understand the center of origin of pigeon pea like in india and also we have identified genes and markers associated with the breeding related traits same thing we did in the case of chickpea where we have sequenced more than 300 lines coming from the 33 different countries and again we have used more or less the same approach and now we got the markers genes associated with the heat tolerance drought tolerance etc not only that one you can also do some evolutionary analysis because in terms of this uh, center of origin for majority of the crop species is considered the fertile crescent or mediterranean region and then the same thing happened in the case of chickpea but then not only that one we also analyze the migration route of chickpea that how this moved to india and other places and our analysis indicate that this came first to the afghanistan and from afghanistan came in parallel to india and ethiopia then this went to the north america and australia so if that's the way that migration happened during last 200 to 400 years in that course of the in the, during this the uh, yeah so during this period that how the chickpea was moving etc so you can use those genetic information and you can use the genotyping platform now you are interested to map the trait of your interest earlier people were developing these biparental population you are having f2s you have recombinant in red lines you can continue to use that one but this are very lengthy process nowadays what we have done that we have developed the new type of trait mapping approaches that now when you have the population you can of course use that f2 but uh, and genotype the entire population but now we also have the possibility of f2 arrays you can have these bulks for two different extremes you just sequence these bulks and then by doing these analysis you can map several traits so nowadays we got large different kind of genetic mapping approaches so what i wanted to say you have a breeding population you can do the phenotyping for the traits of interest and you can do the genotyping and then by using these combination of the approaches you can map the traits of your interest now for instance in the spices sometimes you are interested in the stress related traits sometimes <laughs> flavors etc so you if you are having the phenotyping data for your population for the trait of your interest you can map those traits now by using these kind of approaches Uh, by using these kind of approaches, we have been successful to map 20 to 50 traits in this chickpea ground. So I think we can do similar kind of thing in any species, including spices. So I think this should not be problem. May I request the audiences who are not speaking, probably at this stage only I am speaking, so they can keep their mic on mute mode so that all these other colleagues they can hear properly. Thank you. So yeah, so what I was saying that you can use those genotyping approaches, you can map the trait and then after that, now how to use these information and go for the translational aspect. And for that, we call these approaches called genomic breeding because in our lab, in our institute, we have a lot of emphasis that not just sequencing the genomes, rather that utilizing of these genomes to that uh, crop improvement. Now, some of us are already aware with these approaches of marker assisted selection marker assisted back crossing marker assisted recurrent selection and at ICPZ also we have been using these approaches but nowadays some of the new approaches called forward breeding i will talk about that one haplotype based breeding genomic selection and now the, for using these breeding you need to have appropriate analytical and decision support tools so that when you have the genotyping data with these tools you should be able to identify the lines which need to be used for the future crossing so these are really very important so in my opinion what we need to do as a, any for any crop that we need to have those markers associated with the trade we need to have the genotyping platform we need to have these analytical decision support tools and then by combination of all these things we can use any of these genomic breeding approaches at ICRI said we have been using these approaches so for and through by using these genomic breeding approaches, we have been successful to develop several improved varieties, even in so-called orphan crops like chickpea, because earlier we did not have any resources. So now, for instance, that we released this variety called Jelly 2, it's in, in fact, Ethiopian Institute of Agriculture Research and Indian Institute of Policy Research. So we work together. And now this variety is having more than 15% higher yield in the rain-fed conditions. Not only that, but some or several of my colleagues and collaborators like Dr. Bhardwaj from Indian Agriculture Research Institute. And he worked with us and we developed this line in the genetic background of PUSA 372. And then we developed the improved lines. And this is also drought tolerant called PUSA chickpea 10216. This was released in, I think, in 2019 or so. 
And this is also having the higher yield. And you can see that even the grain protein content is also 22.6%. The other variety in the case of chickpea, we have a disease called fugitive wilt. And this chickpea breeder, now he's retired, but Dr. Manur coming from University of Agriculture Sciences, Aichur, he had this Annigri one variety, but became very susceptible. So what we did together with Dr. Anu, uh, Dr. Manur and Dr. Yeri and Dr. Lakshman from US Raichur, we worked on this aspect and we developed an improved line called Super Annigri one, and this is now tolerant to the fusion wilt. So these are the success stories that how you can use these molecular breeding tools to improve the tolerance to even the complex trait like drought and resistance to the biotech stress trait like fusion wilt. Now another success story from Bhardwaj from IRI that where we have also introgressed the wilt resistance in QTL regions and we have developed this line, which is also having more than 28% yield advantage over the current parent. Same thing, and now our partners from several institute of ICR like IAPR, Indian Institute of Pulses Research, they are also developing those kind of lines using the molecular markers in their breeding program. And in the same way, we are also working in the case of pigeon pea in the six different states with the different breeders and they are using the genomic information to introgress these mark to introgress these QTLs and genes for the different stresses. So these are success stories. Now we have moved to the, some new approaches like we, I was talking about haplotype based breeding. I will take I think a few more minutes. So yeah. So then what we have been that when we are having the genome sequence data like in the case of pigeon pea for this particular gene you are having five different lines. And based on these sequencing data, we can define the haplotypes. Haplotypes are basically the combination of the SNP variation, which inherits together. And then what happens is that we analyze, associate these haplotypes with the phenotypic trait, and then we do this statistical analysis. Now, for instance, when you are having the H1 analysis, H1 haplotype, then you have the plant weight around one gram, for instance, but when you got H2, then you got more than one gram. And this, you have got haplotype three, then you are having less. So now based on these things, we can figure it out that, okay, for plant weight, H2 haplotype is better. For fresh weight, probably H2 haplotype is better. And for uh, turgid weight, you have that haplotype A is better. So by doing these things, what we can do, we can replace the existing haplotypes with that optimized haplotype. And here is the example, like Maruti variety of pigeon pea based on the genome sequence information, we realize that these are having really inferior haplotypes. Now the question is how we can replace these inferior haplotypes by the superior haplotype. So when you use haplotypes in the breeding, we call haplotype based breeding, we are moving it further. Now, another approach is the forward breeding. So what we were doing earlier that by using the back crossing, et cetera, we say, oh, this is not the really good plan now, but if you got the markers, which are diagnostics for your trait, then you should be using to carry forward the breeding, not by using the back crossing. But for that, you need to have the cost effective genotyping platform, and now we have, uh, while working with several partners, we have developed the high throughput genotyping, cost-effective genotyping platform, where you can genotype any line with just one to $1.5 for up to 10 SNPs. And we are having the services for more than 18 crops for 100 trades for more than 1,000 SNPs. So any of you, if you would like to do spices, we can work with you. We can link this platform with you and we can really try to help you in this direction. Last point which I want to mention, and this is about the genomic selection. What is happening that generally what happens in the plant breeding, we take the line, we make the crosses, test them, and then if we found something that we keep on going for the product development. Plant breeding community majority of time has been focused more on the product development aspect. But if you talk to the animal breeding folks, they are focusing more on the population improvement that how you can continue to enhance the population. You are having better lines in each cycle. And with this objective, this is a new approach called genomic selection. So what you do here, you do not need to select the line based on one or two or three markers. Rather, you do the genotype entire population and you select the line based on the whole genome profiling data. And we calculate a value called genomic estimated breeding values. And based on these things, you can keep on moving ahead. So basically, we in these crops now, we have established these different resources and we are moving in the area of the genomic prediction. In the case of chickpea, we are working again with IRI, IAPR, and several state agriculture university and a CRIP program. And our results are very promising, which has shown really high prediction accuracy for even the trades related to the yield. Now we are deploying the genomic selection in Indian National Chickpea Breeding Program, where we are working with the ACRIPS. And right now, the, our population, they are being evaluated 
at several ECRIP locations, and we are already based on these things. We already have selected several crosses uh, lines, and they are being used in that making the new crosses. We need to see the results in coming years that what kind of yield advantages we are having from the genomic selection pipeline. We are also using the genomic selection for developing the hybrids. In the case of pigeon pea, we have the hybrids where you need to improve these parental lines. And now by using the historical data and genotyping data, we can define the new potential combination of the crosses, which can be used and they can take this yield to the next level. And now based on these things, these combinations are also being tested by the ICR IAPR. So I think what I wanted to tell that these technology, in my opinion, can be used and they're very generic thing and of course is specific to different crops but the hypothesis and that uh, uh, that concepts are the same and either use in the chickpea or rice or maize or any spice and for if we would like to use these modern genomics approaches if we would like to modernize our breeding program then i think four things are very important genome germplasm phenotyping and data science and these are the basic ingredients for plant breeding in 21st century and if we have the commitment, if we have the collaboration, then you can use these approaches in any crop, like we have done this translational genomics, even in so-called orphan and non-model crops. Now we are focusing more on the haplotype based breeding, now new approaches, speed breeding, genomic selection, gene editing. I did not discuss about some of these things, but especially in the case of the crops, when you are having the improved varieties, then the varieties basically having the access to the high quality seeds to farmer is very important and the management agronomy and market access also play a very important role and i think that we need to have really good support from the international national and local government and agencies and for developing these kind of modern technology including genetic engineering gene editing etc we need to have the conducive policy environment so with these words i would like to thank you all once again, but would like to thank all of our partners, donors and supporters and all my colleagues and collaborators from ICRISAT and from collaborating organization. And thanks one and all, and thanks to all of our donors and funders. Thank you. And I'm very happy to take up any question right now or later stage, whatever you want to do, Dr. Ishwarwat. Thank you, sir. Thank you for